We are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Alors, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the conference on intelligence cooperation in a multipolar world. Bienvenue à la conférence sur la coopération de renseignement dans un monde multipolaire. Veuillez noter que la conférence est traduite simultanément en français et en anglais. Je vais poursuivre mes remarques en anglais, mais je vous invite, si vous le souhaitez, à choisir la langue de votre choix au bas de votre fenêtre Zoom. My name is Judson Massey. I'm the co-director of the Network for Strategic Analysis and professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal. I'm co-organizing this event in collaboration with my friend and colleague Thomas Junot, a professor at the University of Ottawa and member of, Net of the Network for Strategic Analysis. The network is a nonpartisan inter-university research network funded by Canada's Department of National Defense to mobilize Canadian and global expertise on three strategic challenges, the evolving role of great powers in a shifting world order, multilateral cooperation in international security, and the future of defense capacity building for global partners. Today's conference addresses a theme that connects to each of these challenges. Intelligence cooperation is far from a new phenomenon. The establishment of the Five Eyes Partnership at the beginning of the Cold War institutionalized intelligence cooperation between the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand during the Second World War. This partnership, the most success, successful in, in intelligence cooperation, allowed for a geographic division of intelligence functions against a common threat that was the Soviet bloc. Another example of a framework of intelligence cooperation is the Club de Berne, which was once an informal organization bringing together heads of European security services and is increasingly morphing into a formal international institution. Intelligence cooperation has expanded to a global level with the emergence of international terrorism. This threat continues to pose many challenges for intelligence agencies, but the current power transition and the intensification of the strategic competition between the great powers require a shift in the vision of intelligence cooperation. While terrorism represents a clearly identifiable common and global threat, the multipolar world is a much more subject to diverging threat perceptions. It is furthermore multidimensional in nature. As Canada's intelligence services recently reported, China and Russia are increasingly conducting espionage and foreign influ influence operations, targeting both governmental and non-governmental organizations, whether academic institutions, the private sector, and civil society. Liberal democracies' openness and transparency increase their vulnerabilities to such foreign attacks. These attacks also take advantage of our increasingly computerized economy and society. Cyber attacks are conducted to steal intellectual property, trade secrets, or to achieve geopolitical objectives through the disruption of critical infrastructure and vital services. State-sponsored disinformation is also increasingly used to create divisions and erode confidence in our democratic institutions. In short, the rise of great power competition in a digital world raises numerous challenges for free and open societies and require intelligence cooperation to address them. To discuss these issues and many more, we have assembled an amazing lineup of scholars and professionals eager to share their insights on intelligence cooperation. Today's conference is organized around three panels in addition to our Lanchian keynote address. The first panel, chaired by Jill Sinclair of the Department of National Defense, will discuss the European Union's need for intelligence capabilities to achieve greater strategic autonomy, the accountability issues surrounding intelligence cooperation, as well as the diversity of counterintelligence approaches within European countries. Our keynote speaker, former National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister of Canada, Daniel Jean, will follow with his, his insights stemming from a brilliant career in Canada's public service. The second panel, chaired by Arthur Wilsinski of the Communications Security Establishment, will discuss the challenges resulting from the new Silk Roads and technological changes for transatlantic intelligence sharing, the development of a peacekeeping intelligence policy at the United Nations, as well as the pros and cons of Canadianizing intelligence. Finally, the last panel, chaired by Heather DeSantis of Public Safety Canada, will take a historical 
perspective on intelligence cooperation since the Cold War, Cold War, as well as discuss how deterrence by denial impacts strategic stability and the profound changes underway in the Australian intel intelligence community. I invite you to look at each panelist's full biography available on the online program of the event. Panelists will make a 10 minute presentation followed by comments from their panel chair, after which a Q&A session with you, the audience will take place. I invite you to write down your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window throughout the day. Thank you for being with us this morning or afternoon or evening, depending, depending on where you are in the world. This conference is being recorded and will be made available for replay next week. I'm now, I now turn to Jill Sinclair to chair the, for our first panel. Thank you, Jill, for taking the time to be with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here with everyone today. Um, it says that the, uh, the uh, administrator has disabled my, uh, my video, so I'm here we go. Hopefully I'm with you now. Um, I'm delighted to be able to chair this panel with you uh, today. And as you've said so eloquently in your opening uh, comments, uh, Justin, we have a, a wonderful lineup this morning. Um, I'm delighted to be joined here by Joran Fagerston from the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, Claudia Hillenbrand from Cardiff University, and Gustav Gressel from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, these three individuals are going to walk us through a really fascinating array of analysis and research that will take us from issues of accountability and autonomy to spiral loops of intelligence and the new complexities and to, as you had said, uh, Justin, subversive challenges to the single European space. The interesting thing about our session, I think, is that we will be looking at uh, intelligence very much through a, a, a European lens not an American lens, which is a little bit unusual in the intelligence world. And so I'm delighted to be able to, uh, to chair this session and I will take, uh, take you Bjorn to start us off. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jill. And thanks to the organizers for, for having me for this conference. Um, yes, so I'm gonna present on a, on a paper and a project on uh, intelligence demands linked to European autonomy in trade technology and security. And this draws on my, my earlier research on intelligence cooperation and the more uh, current study of European foreign policy strategy uh, that I do. So the point of departure here really is this European drive towards strategic autonomy. And of course, this is a pretty contested a concept in Europe, but it, it relates to the ability of Europe to play its own role in world politics, to manage its uh, international relations and interdependencies, and to do so based on its own interests and values. And the idea of autonomy is, of course, nothing new. Um, it, it, uh, for example, in, in the 1990s, it was established that the European Union should have some form of autonomous capacity for crisis management tasks. Uh, and later this would grow in the security field to also um, include kind of more loose concepts such as the protection of Europe or Europeans. And then during the last years, this concept has really morphed into all other areas such as uh, digital autonomy, uh, economic autonomy, and now with COVID also health autonomy. So what is autonomy, just short? Well, it's, it's usually a combination of the capacity to act, often understood in terms of material capacity, and the freedom to act. And this freedom could be limited by alliances, hierarchies, or uh, unsupportive hegemons, for example. And quite often, or for most actors, this combination is, is in reality a trade-off as in resources stag hunt, an individual hunter can give up some of his freedom of action in order to gain more of the capacity to, to act together with others. And it's the same uh, when it comes to European politics and autonomy. Or it works the other way around, as in the case of Brexit, you can give up some of your joint capacity of action in order to maximize your freedom. That is another way of strengthening autonomy. 
And what then makes this autonomy strategic? Well, that is no usually that you know your interest, that you know your surrounding, and that you can link your interests and your surrounding and adapt your, your behavior with that in mind. So essentially, strategic autonomy depends on a capacity to act, on a freedom to act, and a willingness, a political will to act. And the first argument I would like to make is that this kind of autonomy has really been a key driver of European intelligence cooperation so far. Um, we've seen it in the establishment of the EU intelligence, INSEN, the, the intelligence analysis function within the EU, which really was set up in order to allow for more autonomous EU foreign policy making. Uh, autonomous both from the US, but also to some extent from the member state. Um, we see it more in the in the field of military intelligence, where there's also an, an uh, ambition to be more autonomous, and here usually from, from the US. Um, but also if we look at other fields, such as uh, security service cooperation, both within the Club de Bain that was mentioned, but also in the counter-terrorist group closer to the European Union, um, it was argued that we needed this capacity in Europe, for example, in the war on terror, uh, so that we just didn't buy the, the US narrative of what constituted the terror threat, but that we had our own independent analysis of the level of threat. So that was an autonomous, an argument of autonomy as well. The second argument is then that as these ambitions for autonomy, which we in, in EU parlance see every day now, as they broaden out to the areas of trade, technology, uh, health, for example, then, of course, this will create new intelligence demands, just as the old security ones did during the, during the last 20 years. And in the paper I look at, uh, I divide the, the area or application maybe of strategic autonomy in four different fields, decision making autonomy, operational autonomy, trade autonomy, and tech autonomy, and I'll just shortly introduce them. I'll try to let the interpreters uh, get on home. So the decision making autonomy is essentially the ability to act on your interests and, and take independent uh, decisions. And intelligence has a clear role here in identifying interests, uh, identifying activities or uh, structures worthy of protection, uh, identifying critical uh, dependencies, but also to manage kind of hostile actions by, by external actors that's trying to influence our decision making. And I would say much has, quite a lot has been done here within the EU to strengthen this intelligence support. Uh, but of course, more will have to be, be done as the EU tries to become a more effective decision maker, for example, by moving away from majority voting when it comes to foreign policy. Well, that would likely increase the demand for more intelligence support to manage this system. If we look at operational autonomy, which is essentially the autonomy being able to implement operational security policies such as mission, this is also extremely intelligence demanding. And we, we have quite a few examples here of, of operations that has either been made impossible, didn't happen, or was more difficult to do because of the lack of intelligence. The Libya uh, operation, for example, is one case where the lack of intelligence and intelligence cooperation really became critical for the operation. Um, and this is also an area where we've seen quite a lot of development lately uh, with a more operational role for the EU, uh, traditionally more strategic oriented intelligence apparatus, uh, more support from the satellite uh, center with imagery and geospatial intelligence to EU operations and, and more is happening. If we look at some of the more the new areas of autonomy, such as trade autonomy, um, we see much less intelligence support. Trade autonomy could essentially could be about making the EU less vulnerable to risks along global supply chains, securing access to foreign goods and services, avoiding certain products being exported to third countries, uh, blocking access for, for some actors, or uh, through sanctions or by screening foreign direct investments. Just a few examples of, of trade autonomy. Mm. And all of these uh, place pretty high demands of intelligence support, at least in a national system. But so far, we don't see much of this on an EU level, uh, only I, when it comes to sanctions. So this is definitely an area where if, if the EU becomes more serious uh, with trade autonomy, we will see much more of intelligence demand also on an EU level. And then finally, tech autonomy 
uh, which is the the, the EU's uh, ability to have control over of a digital and technological system, the, the ability to develop, regulate, acquire, and deploy critical infrastructure in an autonomous way, or at least at the minimum, not in a way that implies damaging vulnerabilities and dependencies. And this also is likely to have a major impact when it comes to intelligence demands in Europe. Um, both in terms of intelligence support to achieve this form of autonomy, uh, but also, of course, this new technology means a lot for the actual workings of intelligence. And we see this uh, strongly on the national level, as, as well as, uh, I mean, in, in all countries of the world. But I'll just take an example close to home in Sweden. It was the military intelligence and the security services that together went together entered the process of the 5G establishment in Sweden and, and stopped the Chinese Huawei from being part of this development. Uh, and if in the future we want to do more of this kind of action, controlling critical technology within the EU, then of course we need to have this sort of intelligence support also on the EU level. Uh, so taken together, there's quite a lot of active work underway in all dimensions of autonomy. Um, which will drive the need for further intelligence cooperation and support uh, in the EU and for the EU. Um, so what are the prospects to, to um, make sure that this happens? Well, first of all, there are all the usual kind of barriers to intelligence cooperation in this field of uh, fields of autonomy. Uh, there's, there's still a lack of sufficient trust. There's some legal barriers. There's bureaucratic and professional cultures that differ. And of course, national, uh, different national interests within the EU. Um, but there's also lots of work to remedy this. There's an intelligence college uh, where we have joint training. There's work to define, to define more common interests, to build common strategic culture within Europe. For example, the process of the, it's called the strategic compass within the EU. But in parallel, there's also work to give the EU more of its own capabilities, access to more sensors. There's funding within the EU to, to support research and, and funding on, for example, maritime and space uh, sensors. So that would be one way to satisfy this demand. But still, there, there's lots of barriers. But if we look at the area of or these new areas of uh, autonomy ambitions when it comes to trade and tech, I think it's more complicated because here we have really different national traditions in Europe. I mean, all member states support their more traditional security policy with intelligence, but not all member states support the tech sector or, or even aim for some kind of technical autonomy or sovereignty. So this is new for member, many member states. And then it's also quite difficult to establish and design suitable support at the EU level. And it also got, comes down to very different perspective of how much the state should actually be involved in the functioning of the market and help specific companies. Some European states are, are pretty confident or I mean, happy to do that, others are less so. It raises the question of ownership. And this is the third point here. When it comes, when we discussed more traditional areas of, of strategic autonomy, such as decision making and missions or operations, these are clearly member state domains. But what about trade and tech? That is typically the area of competence of the European Commission, uh, a technocratic machinery in, in essence. Are we confident to, to kind of uh, allow the, the EU Commission to become more of an intelligence actor, at least in this field, uh, and channel intelligence to these activities? Uh, I'm not sure. And that leads me to the, to the final point, which is really about accountability. Uh, if, if, these, if we follow through with these ideas about strategic autonomy, that will create lots of intelligence demand. And as we see, there are processes with, to, towards we are building up the intelligence capacity. But then I think our, our current system of accountability will simply not be enough. And this, this creates a kind of a spiral of, of uh, integration where we have more autonomy, and then that will lead to more intelligence, and that will lead to more accountability structures, which also most likely will have to be take place at least partly on a kind of federal level. And I think member states are, let's say, more or less happy with this kind of federalization spiral that is unlocked by, by autonomy. So just to conclude, uh, autonomy is a contested concept but it's underpinning policy development in a range of issues in the EU right now. And traditionally, this has been a driver of intelligence cooperation. And I think there's every reason to believe that this will be the case also now. And without intelligence capacity, autonomy will be shallow or illusionary. 
but but supplying this necessary intelligence is actually not that straightforward um, and and in some cases i think to reach common autonomy member states will have to sacrifice some of their national autonomy and this calculation will will look rather different among member states but also look different between these areas of autonomy but thanks i think i'll stop there jill Bjorn, thanks so much for launching us so well uh, with, uh, with all of the questions about autonomy and, and intelligence as an enabler of autonomy. I can see a lot of themes that we'll want to come back to, but uh, people will not believe us if we say that we did not actually coordinate a trois before this session, because you uh, talked about the spiral of integration, which leads us very elegantly uh, to Claudia, who will talk to us about the spiral loop of intelligence liaison. So over to you, Claudia. Hi there. Thanks, Jill, and uh, thanks everybody for organizing this this great event and and for being here today. Today, yeah. So um, my paper um, is very much based on the idea that um, we might need to reconsider what intelligence cooperation really is in order to grasp the enormity of the challenge that some liaison arrangements pose for accountability. Um, because collaboration naturally increases the invisibility of intelligence. And I'm putting forward in this paper this notion of the spiral loop um, as an image to understand a little bit better what, what are these key features of international cooperation that make accountability so complicated and at times at the moment impossible. And um, I'm putting three features forward. One is the, the great flexibility and the rapid speed with which some of these arrangements are changing. If you think of the, the, the image of, of a spiral as being a very flexible and bouncy thing, um, that applies to some um, cooperation arrangements as well. The second feature is um, um, the, the wide reach of participants, um, the multinodal networks that have emerged at times with uh, a global reach. And the third feature I'm looking at is what I call the thickened secrecy, where we are seeing deep inside some of these spirals a certain blurring of um, the cooperation and, and the metrics around it. And all of that. Um, um, as I've looked at then in, in various primary sources, looking at parliamentary investigations into mass surveillance as much as uh, renditions and extraordinary, uh, extraordinary renditions and secret detention campaigns. Um, and, and I'm picking reports here from the UK, the US, Canada, uh, Germany and others. Um, we can really see that, especially in the 21st century now, parliaments and other accountability holders struggle to get to um, grips with this new uh, panorama of intelligence cooperation, really. Now, the paper in, in the first section starts off with a bit of an overview of, of the existing literature on cooperation, uh, which is a bit patchwork-like uh, with, with some very good work in there. But I think that the, for me, the very interesting literature um, is the one coming from a sociological point of view to this, emphasizing very much the reflexivity of intelligence work and the changes um, over time. Um, Pepin Tournier in one of his re recent papers in Intelligence and National Security put it very nicely where he said that we should understand contemporary intelligence cooperation very much as I quote, a process being the initial decision to cooperate as much as the activities shaping it afterwards and the outcome they bring. So really that kind of puts forward a quite different understanding to some of the um, liaison arrangements uh, that have been conceptualized previously. And of course, counterterrorism, um, the counterterrorism agenda has been a big driver in pushing um, some of these arrangements um, um, very much uh, forward. Um, the US obviously being a very dominant uh, uh, partner within this field, but, but joined by a number of traditional allies as much as uh, new and unconventional uh, partners. Uh, and a lot of this cooperation has taken arguably a more operational turn 
uh, over the last um, two decades. <coughs> and accountability, of course, cannot function without transparency, right? Ac accountability bodies need to be able to trace and to identify individuals, events, um, uh, materials, procedures, etc., in order to actually um, um, do their job and, and, and to judge the efficiency and effectiveness and appropriateness of intelligence cooperation. And so this is, has been made more complicated by the three features that I suggested at the very beginning. And I want to talk first now about flexibility and amorphousness a tiny bit. So we are seeing a whole lot of, of arrangements which are not built on permanent scaffolding. So moving away from very kind of traditional setups um, um, like the Five Eyes arrangement and others, th there's much more going on on a pragmatic one-off um, on and off um, um, level, and that uh, obviously needs to be taken into account. And of course, these liaison arrangements are also very much shaped by the international order, um, depending on um, particular friendships between governments, depending on, on the, the political dilemmas of the day, etc. cetera. Um, um, that is very much affecting the overall shape uh, and the depth of cooperation um, at any point. The second point was um, the global reach and the multinodality um, um, of some of these arrangements. And there we have really seen that the counterterrorism counterterrorism agenda in particular has really um, kind of opened up um, options for cooperation among a huge uh, amount of partners and that crosses the public-private divide as much as it has a global reach um, at the state level. So um, if you think a lot of the discussions about the Snowden revelations also included um, private companies, um, and internet providers, um, and social media platforms, etc., etc., to, to just give uh, one example. But also within this global reach of cooperation, what we are increasingly seeing, I argue in the paper, is actually seeing a certain globalization and approximation and at times harmonization of intelligence work. Uh, and Björn briefly mentioned the, the intelligence college uh, uh, in Europe, um, which is one step into this direction of kind of building up a certain uh, common a foundation on which it will be easier to kind of cooperate. It is an approximation uh, to some extent of what um, can be done in cooperation, whether that's related to common training, uh, understanding each other better in cultural terms um, and linguistic skills and so on and so forth. So that um, needs to be taken into account as well. Um, and. And then um, this kind of, of uh, integration and globalization um, <coughs> to some extent can start to kind of affect the overall matrix in which these things are taking place. And Edward Snowden has kind of provided some examples um, for that quite nicely, where we are seeing that, uh, especially in the field of SIGINT, we are having cooperative arrangements where systems are built to work with each other and where partners increasingly rely on each other's work. So entangling that at any point would come at huge costs to individual um, agencies or, or countries. Um, and so that kind of creates a complexity which for accountability holders, um, as we have seen in, in the subsequent investigations, is nearly impossible to understand um, and comes on top of um, the technology uh, challenges, um, the tech know-how that is really required in order to understand some of these um, cooperative elements. And the third feature uh, I'm pointing out is the thickened secrecy, which to some extent obviously emerges from the, from the previous two features, but is very distinct as well. Um, Sir David Omer, in his, in his most recent work, has talked about deep cooperation, as he called it, using the UK and the US uh, as, as one of these examples. 
Um, and here we are seeing that obviously people, states and agencies can nearly sit in each other's pockets at times. Um, and these kind of interwoven partnerships might be um, very useful from a pragmatic point of view um, um, and, and might achieve uh, very good outcomes at times, but it is something which leads to a certain blurring of, of frameworks and restrictions and, and, um, and, and performances, which for ac accountability holders, which are very much stuck at the national level at the moment, are very, very difficult um, to trace. And the inquiries both in the UK and in the United States uh, into extraordinary renditions are a key example for that, where we, where we see um, a lot of what has been going on um, um, what was, there was an awareness very much uh, on, on the British side about what was going on to some extent um, in this campaign, um, but, but a certain kind of reluctance to actually start asking too many questions about it, to challenge certain behaviors, but a great appetite to actually exploit um, what was very much uh, a CIA-led uh, um, um, campaign. So to sum it up, um, what I'm proposing here is that this notion of the spiral loop is, is, a, is a very helpful image to kind of emphasize some of the problems um, that liaison creates from a perspective of democratic accountability um, and that it helps to kind of show uh, some of the intricacies of liaison um, and I think um, we need to have urgent discussions about this um, with policymakers um, um, and, and, and trying to kind of find ways in which um, this kind of new challenge um, can be tackled in a meaningful way and allow for accountability holders to actually hold agencies to account in a meaningful way. Thanks very much for your attention. Claudia, thank you so much. Uh, when we all looked at the title, I'm sure we thought, my goodness, where will a spiral loop of intelligence uh, take us? But clearly it's taken us to a very cogent and coherent approach to unpacking the complexities of modern intelligence cooperation with all the blurring lines that you've so well explained. Um, Gustav, I'd like to turn to you now for a more subversive uh, insight into the world of uh, the single European space and intelligence cooperation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So I, I will basically uh, uh, turn my previous speaker upside down and will argue for more and not for less. Um, uh, I also, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an intelligence academic. I, I worked in the Ministry of Defense before and now care for security affairs. So it's more of a practitioner's perspective you get here uh, than, than, than a purely academic one. So um, yeah, the, the, the single European market um, uh, created uh, in 1957 uh, was built around four fundamental freedoms, the freedom, the free circulation of goods, services, people and capital. Uh, and uh, as it is absolutely undisputed that this brought a great uh, length of wealth and prosperity to the European continent, uh, of course, it is uh, um, also a matter of fact, unfortunately, that this is also these freedoms are also abused by by people uh, with the, um, intentions, bad intentions uh, from the terrorists. But specifically, of course, now I talk about intelligence agencies and yeah. sorry yeah. and yeah. sorry now I have been in Reden. That's, that's and okay. I, I, I'm, okay. I'm totally yeah. sorry. Um, don't have to apologize at all. Uh, uh, and, and so, of course, you need you, you kind of need to secure this this freedom uh, that you have created for your ordinary citizens and create mechanisms to to follow up on what's going on and how the abuses are going around. And I try to I try to introduce you into into some problems we are facing with that. So. Starting with free travel, um, the, the, the so-called Schengen system, this is sort of the, the, next to the Euro, the biggest visible achievement of European unity so far. 
um, created in, in 1984. Uh, it also encompasses quite a lot of uh, legal work on harmonizing uh, mutual recognitions of arrest war warrants, verdicts uh, of procedures and, and, and police work. It was also accompanied by uh, creating the Schengen information system, uh, basically a crude information system where you could exchange uh, data on people, goods, bank bills, um, goods usually meaning cars and car plate information. But the problem is it was very much restricted. Uh, you had a national data set and uh, you explicitly need to pass on information to the European ones. You had no, out state A had no automatic uh, connection or access to, to individual sort of nations B data set. Uh, and usually inf information was only shown if there was a tangible concrete arrest warrant or a grave suspicion of a crime being committed. Uh, so you had, of course, uh, red notices on criminals, uh, but the problem is on intelligence. Intelligence officers usually don't travel with a red notice. So if, if they come that far, you know, they are withdrawn. Um, but they're rather persons of interest and on persons of interest, information is not exchanged or was not exchanged for a very long time. Also the visa information system that was created in 2011 um, uh, only accounts for short-term visas. Uh, there was a wide bouquet of variety of uh, uh, freedom of action for individual states to grant also longer term visas. And if you look into the Cyprotic and Maltese practice of, of selling these Schengen visas out, uh, the, the, that was a pretty problematic situation. There was, of course, no information on these visas shared across the EU. But of course, the people that received such visas could travel freely in the entire Schengen area. Um, also, we have no exchange of flight or entry data. So uh, even if a visa is granted, if the person, if it's a multi-entry visa, this person can travel in and out and it's not shared when, if, and where this, this person has traveled in and out the Schengen area. Um, and uh, there is no exchange on, on additional data, for example, on, on phone registrations. Uh, phone registrations also since 2018, only phones need to be registered even uh, payback phones, uh, prepaid phones. Sorry, uh, the it's a national it's a natural prerogative. If if a spy travels with an Austrian phone to Germany, the Germans don't know that this phone automatically belongs to a spy. They just see another Austrian number popping up. Uh, so so all this is very clumsy. Uh, also. Biometric data exchange is very clumsy, restricted to very few people, to uh, very few contingencies. Um, so, and, and that has led at multiple occasions that basically intelligence services or counter intelligence services uh, have a, a very low situation or awareness of what is going on in that country. And that once an incident happened and you had a, a broad variety of incidents from starting from Skripal assassination to uh, detonations of ammunition depots, uh, poisoning of uh, weapons dealers, etc. Quite, quite, quite a lot going on actually. And these are only the high profiles ones that makes it that make it into the news. Um, the, on an operational daily routine, there is uh, an X fold of, of operations going on in our countries. Usually, only after something happens and the damage was done. Uh, that you can slowly, slowly put the parcels together on who went where and who actually has done what. At that time, of course, it is too late. Um, just to give you an example, there was one, uh, if, you, if you go through the Bellingcat files, which is sort of the, 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 best, the best open access to, to the kind of information about travels of, of, of Russian operatives and spies, uh, there was one, uh, Colonel, a senior figure in the FSB, uh, a long time head of a special operation unit, uh, who, uh, despite that he was sort of a person of interest in, in many countries' counterintelligence service, uh, was, was able to enter uh, the European Union from 2014 to 2020, 21 times at different locations. And the interesting thing, of course, is uh, except for some locations that might be holiday destinations, uh, he usually used airports that are very good connected to the European railroad system. So where then you can commute to a train and go wherever you like. Uh, and, and from the entry point, it's completely unclear where actually this guy went and whether he really stayed in that country. Um, if you also look into sort of the, 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 the data logs that Bellicat provided on several spying operations against the FIFA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, or, or 
uh, the, the recent bombing in, in the Czech Republic, uh, you see that a lot of times sort of entry and exit points were in different countries than in the country of operation. This was uh, widely used by, by Russian uh, hit teams to kind of blur the traces and confuse the investigators. Uh, and in order to, 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 to drive underneath the radar of counterintelligence. Uh, if they would have traveled to the to the point of operation all the time, probably counterintelligence in Switzerland or or in che in the Czech Republic uh, or elsewhere would would have started to to catch suspicion. But if you if a travel if you disperse your travel across other countries, it doesn't. A free circul circulation of finances uh, that that basically is pretty much the same story. Um, so despite we have a common currency in the union and there is a lot of regulation on 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 fiscal policy on common fiscal policy only 2010 the, the sort of the, the the banking crisis and then the uh the the national equity crisis uh convinced the europeans to to actually create a european banking authority in 2010 and and all the the legislation connected to it to make uh, to create an effective banking supervision or financial supervision body was amended uh, uh, multiple times and actually only the fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive in 2018 gave a bit of a more robust posting uh, where where you had the EU fiscal intelligence service to uh, be granted real access to, to national data uh, and and to increase the, the the capacity and also the the cap uh, the legal Sort of legal foundations of of uh, banking of the European banking supervision bodies to uh, to really control uh, their their national counterparts. That is because national banking supervision often was uh, inadequate. Uh, uh, the, the the problem here is that on on the banking sector we actually find the problem is when it comes banks are not the only people who push money around. We have things like. Um, Financial service companies. Uh, the most famous now, uh, of course, is Wirecard, which went bust. Uh, uh, if you if you look into old Wirecard advertisements, uh, what they what they what they want to sell their customers. Basically, they have a kind of financial service that comes that is an intermediary be, between a customer, often abroad, and your national bank account and credit card uh, company. Uh, and and Wirecard would sort of for you, or that was the business model, uh, collect the money abroad, uh, take all the due diligence duties, etc., and transfer it into the EU uh, and, uh, and put it onto your bank account. And you can run global shipping and shopping operations and be a businessman wherever you want, and you don't have to care for your financial security. That was the scam, or that was the scheme. Uh, in practice, we also know now that this was used uh, by, by uh, especially Iranian, um, uh, services, but also by Russian services to uh, to uh, uh, transfer money uh, uh, below the radar of European banking supervision bodies, uh, because if uh, because the, the the payment then uh, can appear inside the European Union from a clean account uh, that was sort of laundered in in the Wirecard Empire, uh, and only Wirecard knows where actually the money from outside really came from. Uh, and it is it is quite telling that when the the, the company went bankrupt, uh, how many murky operations from mercenaries in Libya to um, uh, to asylum seekers uh, care packages uh, uh, along along uh, along the Mediterranean and the Balkan routes, where, where Wirecard tried to to trace and uh, financially certain people, uh, a lot of very murky operations appeared where Wirecard was involved as a payments provider. And that if you give given sort of the logic of circumventing financial supervisions through that company, it all of course makes sense from a hostile intelligence uh, perspective. Uh, but of course we. Then need to we need to see that our current regulatory and investigative framework does, uh, by by any standard, not match up to the threat challenge. Um, and and as as sort of to make things more complicated <clears throat> before I run out of time, um, the the problem gets even bigger if you end if you enter strategic corruption, uh, because as I said before, much of especially counterintelligence competences are national capabilities are national uh, suspects are traced by national 
uh, binational uh, counterintelligence policy, which for many small countries uh, in, in the EU is very difficult because they have very small and less capable services, like my home country, Austria, for example. Um, and uh, uh, and if you if you then insert strategic corruption where courts, uh, intelligence services, uh, uh, police departments are uh, uh, undermined by by moles by people who work for the other side, uh, undermined by corruption issues, bound by political loyalties where politicians can demand certain people to be off limit for investigations, this, this, uh, this whole problem gets even bigger because the entire EU, um, the, the entire European Union structure on anti-money laundering and financial supervision and on, on uh, internal security rests on a proper and um, good faith cooperation amongst the European nations. Uh, and if you look deeper into the uh, Austrian uh, uh, BVT scandal, we call it in Austria, it's the, it's the, it's the civilian, the, not the military one, but the civilian counterintelligence service that was involved in, uh, in, in, in providing information uh, to both Russian intelligence services and to the Freedom Party about uh, certain political actors and, and the intelligence service operations itself. Uh, and it was also connected to the Wirecard scandal because uh, Mazalek, the, the, the sort of CEO of, of Wirecard, had very, very well connections to certain operatives within that uh, inter counterintelligence service uh, and used that uh, uh, to its own uh, financial advantage, at least, if not to the advantage of his, its, his primary client in Moscow. Um, and his, uh, he's now somewhere in Russia, pro pro most probably uh, Moscow. Uh, his his departure from the EU was facilitated by this service, and the sort of the, this this particular operative is now in custody, uh, and and the investigations are still ongoing. Uh, they have revealed that by strategic corruption, by sort of personal friendships, party ties, uh, you could basically outmaneuver the entire national surveillance and and um, alert system on these matters. And if 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 the European system uh, rests on good faith cooperation, you basically bring all your allies in the Union at risk with such behavior. And, and having, unfortunately, states where strategic corruption is big, and uh, of course, Austria is one of them, but uh, we have to also uh, mention, mention Cyprus, Malta, uh, Bulgaria, uh, and particularly Hungary under Orban. Uh, and and uh, and unfortunately, I also have to mention term Germany to some extent because they're not that much corrupt, but enormously clumsy and ineffective. Uh, that such weak spots are exploited with with laughter and merriment by by the Russians. Uh, and here, I sort of I, I bring in the transatlantic security cooperation why it matters because uh, up to this date. Uh, U.S. pressure on individual states to get their act together. Uh, the threat of financial crime investigations in in the U.S. Uh, and and extraterritorial sanctions on certain persons are are the biggest biggest pressure point to get uh, to discipline uh, nations that that do not fulfill their legal obligations uh, in counterintelligence. Um, and it's it's of course it's a bit embarrassing for, if you see all the rhetoric on strategic autonomy and the global player and the geopolitical Europe etc. Uh, but uh, we 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 need the Americans to get our own house in order. Uh, without them, is sort of uh, putting our balls into the nutcracker and and hit the and press the button really hard. Nothing nothing really happens in Europe. Thanks. Gustav, thank you so much for that. Very provocative and lots of great themes there. And I think it's very interesting that even when we try to have a conversation about how we're working in a certain sphere without the United States, all roads seem to lead to Washington. Um, but look, I've got, there are a number of questions that have been put into the chat uh, function and I will come back to them. But I'd like to start by just tossing out a, a couple of questions um, to the three of you, because interestingly, as I say, we, we did not uh, coordinate uh, this effort here, but there's a couple of really uh, important themes here. Uh, Gustav, you, you looked at things very much sort of through 
um, the the national lens, and I and I kind of took a note saying you know strategic cooperation, but strategic corruption. Um, and you talked about the abuse of intelligence agencies. Um, both Claudia and uh, and Bjorn, you know, you talked about the limits or the limitations of nationally focused accountability as we either go into these spirals, which are these interwoven ecosystems of intelligence cooperation, um, or we move to something uh, more aspirational like um, strategic autonomy. And so I'd like to ask you, perhaps starting um, with uh, Claudia, with you, and then uh, Gustav, and then Bjorn, what about the limitations of, um, of nationally focused accountability? How do we deal with that? And how do we move and can we move to uh, transnational type of accountability structures? And I'd like to posit the thought, again, that I'd like you all to react to, given the importance of accountability in the intelligence sphere in terms of social license and trust, all of the things that we know are under great threat in our democracies at the moment for a variety of reasons. Um, can we hardwire accountability into mandates and legislation more effectively to deal with the limitations of nationally focused accountability? So with that, maybe can I, um, I'll start with, the, with you, Claudia, and then Gustav and Bjorn, and I encourage people to throw in their questions. Those of you that have typed in, um, I am going to get to them uh, immediately after this first round of uh, comments on my question here. Over. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question, isn't it? And especially in the EU context, it's becoming in, in increasingly interesting, this question of where should accountability sit if the EU kind of increases its in intelligence capacity. Um, now, I, I think, first of all, we need to say that even at the national level, accountability, to some extent, is a bit of a patchwork arrangement, right? Because we have uh, parliamentary bodies involved in it that can be standing committees, that can be one-off inquiries. Um, we have the courts, and Wesley, I think, mentioned that in, the, in, the, in one of the questions as well. Uh, we have courts or, or other judicial bodies involved in, in accountability. Um, you have to include the media. Um, our, you know, uh, partly globalized uh, um, media outlets uh, playing some part in there. So, so the arrangement is already quite quite convoluted, and these bodies do not necessarily co cooperate with each other um, and and are having different uh, agendas um, and covering different aspects of of uh, accountability demands. And um, in, in the case of the extraordinary rendition campaign, for example, we have seen European bodies such as the Council uh, of, of Europe, um, but also the, the European Parliament trying to kind of investigate uh, these issues in a little bit more detail, arguing that because it affects several uh, of their member states, they have a mandate to kind of investigate the issue. Um, um, and the Council of Europe's reports by, by Senator Dick Marty in 2006 and 2007 were arguably very, very strong and powerful to some extent, but also uh, had very clear limitations. Um, the investigation subsequently by the European Parliament was much, much weaker in many respects. Um, but then the, the European Parliament, for example, dropped the ball afterwards and did not kind of continue that due to political um, um, concerns and, and um, um, less political willingness that would have been required to make uh, this, this success. So things are complicated um, and, and what accountability should look like at a supranational level is, is far from clear. But I think what is clear at the moment is um, that many of, the, of, of those accountability bodies which are stuck at the national level find it very difficult to investigate issues which cross state borders. Um, sometimes it is because intelligence actors can just hide by saying, oh, if we would reveal this kind of information that would affect our cooperation with the other partners, they would not trust us anymore because we are opening up here too much um, and therefore th this would kind of damage our arrangement. Or they might 
suggest that because they, their arrangement is based on a, a memorandum of understanding or a similar legal framework, they are, they are not permitted by law to actually expose some of the information that would be necessary for the accountability bodies to, to judge uh, what has actually happened and, and uh, to trace things back. So these limitations uh, are very severe and, and a discussion needs to be had about what that is. I mean, what we do know is that, for example, parliamentary accountability bodies here uh, in Europe, but also beyond kind of talk to each other, right? There's an exchange of good practice. There's an exchange of, hi, hey, what have you been doing this year? How do you approach certain things, et cetera? Um, so, so there is communication going on. And, and, you know, you have an oversight board for the five eyes, of course, now since, uh, uh, a few years ago, um, where those countries are uh, represented in terms of accountability to kind of get to uh, a, a joint understanding of, of what has happened. So, so we are seeing interesting moments um, um, of these kind of uh, uh, supranational or transnational moments of accountability in some respect. Um, but where we are going with this is um, there's, there's no clear political will uh, in either direction, I'd say. Thanks, Claudia. Gustav, could you pick that up a little bit and maybe come back to the points that you made about, you started off talking about the abuse by intelligence agencies, and you talked about the clumsiness sort of of some national systems of accountability and that weak spots are exploited by adversaries. So what's the hope here for you know, a more supranational, not US uh, catalyzed approach to better accountability? Well, it has to be it has to be in Brussels. So there, there is a minimum sort of intelligence cooperation cell in Brussels um, that that few people know and that has very few competences and even less staff. Uh, but but it would be a start. Um, uh, you, you make them accountable as I mean, of course, the, the accountability of the Commission before the Parliament could be improved. But uh, uh, to be honest, the accountability of the Commission and the investigative powers of the European Parliament, vice versa, the Commission is much better than actually the competences of many national and the real capacities of many, many, many national parliaments in the EU to control their own governments, uh, to be frank. So for most countries, uh, that would be a huge improvement if, if we would sort of uh, create intelligence-wise a counterpart to the EU fis fiscal intelligence and, and, uh, and banking authorities on, in the intelligence uh, sector. Um, and make it accountable to uh, to the European Parliament. Uh, have a special classified committee. Uh, you have, of course, the trustworthy pick, uh, the parliamentarians. But uh, amongst amongst the seven hundred, actually, there are quite excellent people, uh, and there are quite capable people. So there is no structural reason not to do this. Um, uh, but we also need. Uh, the problem is with you need to have a some somebody who really squeezes or takes away the uh, the privileges of of some member states to to uh, corrupt their entire political system and the judiciary. The battle for the judiciary, be it in Poland, in Hungary, in Bulgaria, uh, uh, and 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 other states, is is one of the key issues on accountability that that we really face. Uh, and and if we would have a a, a Euro European appeals court and a European prosecutory service for for such things like political heavy political crimes like political motivated murder for for, for corruption on, on sort of of higher offices uh, of of treason um, uh, 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 we would be in a very different place because it it is much easier if you if you come from a small country like Austria uh, it is for for big enterprises in that country, for, for political actors, uh, it is very easy to kind of take over or, or bully yourself into a space of invulnerability with the national institutions. Because the country is small, because everybody knows everybody, because at, at some point you will, you will own or need a favor from somebody uh, in the system. But Brussels is too big for these games. Uh, down, uh, sometimes you can get in the way of things, but you don't hold them up like you do in small countries. 
Um, this is, uh, this is uh, on this I'm pretty much sort of a European federalist, although I, I really hate the expression, but uh, we, uh, to, to lift this up on, on the EU institutional level is the only serious chance to tackle it. Thanks, Gustav. Well, uh, Bjorn, that walks us very nicely back to, I think, where you, where you started us off. Uh, you actually talked about um, decision-making competencies and then e the EU Commission uh, as an intelligence actor. And that seems to be what Gustav is, is suggesting. And, uh, you know, I'd like to add on to my, my, my question to you about the limitations of nationally focused accountability and hardwiring accountability into mandates. Um, Maybe uh, what we're hearing here is that given the, the governance and other issues within at the national level within European countries, and I'd say all countries, um, maybe this more integrated approach to accountability for intelligence services, in fact, is a precursor to greater strategic autonomy by definition. What do you think of that? Well, I think this is pretty, pretty um, difficult to achieve. I mean, it's it's not difficult in in theory or as a researcher to to create the, like the, the perfect system of uh, of accountability uh, by way of institutional design um and uh, but but in practice it is not that easy and i think if if we look at the, the area of accountability um you you will need to find uh, to make that happen you will need to find the, the political will as claudia was into or the kind of the political agency to make that happen and I think I'm not so sure that the, the EU member states are are that keen to to see these kind of competencies uh, move to Brussels. Uh, I just remember when when the the Snowden files, uh, the, the the kind of this scandal when it was as the most heated debate in Sweden. Sweden still resisted any kind of calls for the European Parliament to look into this and to travel to Washington and and uh, ask uh, sharp questions. I think it was Sweden and the UK who said no. Uh, please don't. And we stopped that because we had no interest or the, the, the government by the time to have our signals intelligence cooperation with the US uh, kind of investigated by, by a, a leaky European Parliament. Um, and, and to some extent, I think uh, uh, Gustav's uh, talk, I mean, excellent in, in displaying some of the, the gaps that exist when we open up more of a common space, but we can't really police it or, or control it. Uh, to the extent. I mean, that's that's a long story. That's why Helmut Kohl wanted to start Europol in the beginning, because he was wary of the kind of the, the way criminals would be able to travel within this European space. So that, I mean, that's that's just neo-functional logic where you create a space and then you create problems and then you create solutions. And there, there you have your spiral. The problem now with just giving more competences for the European Commission, as an example, and the European Commission has been willing to get into intelligence for, for decades. Uh, they've been trying to suggesting that the the CTG or even the Club de Bern should be as should be inserted to, within the European Commission, uh, but it never happened because the security services who hold most of this information that is needed to police this space, as Gustav was into, uh, they don't want to share it with with organizations that they see as leaky or simply belonging to other bureaucratic or or uh, uh, professional cultures. They are hesitant even to share. Uh, their secret information with the police organizations because they are security services. And so to ask them to share information or to be accountable uh, before um, the European Commission or one of these bodies, it's, uh, I think that that's a pretty tough argument. So there's a, the risk here that yes, we can, we can create the perfect accountability system with the effect that very little information will be sent uh, to uh, instances where, where this, uh, well, this information will reach these systems. So uh, information exchange will keep on being based on informal networks, which is the key, the, 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 the rule when it comes to at least to security services. Uh, leaving only essentially legal or law enforcement intelligence within the EU structure where it fits well with the, the more kind of legal structure of cooperation. So there's a dilemma here. We can create a perfect system, but it might not be used. And then you still have these kind of gaps uh, that Gustav indicated uh, where we can't really protect ourselves. Or we can accept more informality, perhaps slightly less accountability, but more actual sharing of information. Um, doesn't have to be like this, but I think that is a real dilemma that we're sitting with right now. 
Well, thanks, Bjorn. Uh, great, great round of answers here. And again, it walks us nicely into a number that I have online. And forgive me if I miss any of them, I'll try to capture them. Um, and I'm going to do them in sort of clusters. We have uh, about 32 minutes left in our session here. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, from Wesley Wark, one to each of you, actually. And Wesley, um, I'm just going to try to capture them. Uh, to Bjorn, um, intelligence capabilities, if we talk about uh, intelligent capabilities that might affect the EU um, intelligence autonomy, are there gaps in these capabilities? Um, and Claudia, um, uh, Wesley has asked about Five Eyes and the role of the courts, which you had noticed uh, in the chat function here. Gustav, uh, thanks for the great talk. And given bell cat, uh, belling cat capabilities, does this point to a need for a stronger European intelligence open source capability? And maybe all of you would like to reflect a little bit on, on open source. Um, and I'm going to add uh, the next question in, if you don't mind, just so that we can make best use of our times here. Um, and it's a, it's a question um, in French. And it is, uh, let me just see, I'm just going to look. Um, uh, you know, I'd like to know, um, let me just see, I'm trying to translate it on the go here, but I think that the translators have given me one. Um, Justin, help me out if I just can't find it here. Um, you speak about autonomy of freedom, collaboration, protection, democracy, but these, uh, these agencies, these information agencies or intelligence agencies, aren't they at the service of ideologies, certain groups that, um, you know, that, that um, have power to kind of affect you know, privacy um, or also kind of conduct their own not so positive actions? Um, I'm going to stop there, I think, and then I will add the next. We've got another few that have come in. So again, maybe I'll just do it in, in uh, reverse order here. Um, uh, Bjorn and then uh, Claudia and Gustav. Thanks. Uh, I think I'll, I'll start with the, the, um, the open source intelligence, which I, yes, I think that's, that's an an excellent area where the where the EU could do uh, great work, and it's uh, because that's that's uh, especially if we bring the European Commission into this discussion, uh, they are known for collecting a lot of information and uh, on on companies, on member states, on the air quality. I mean, they have sensors and sense making systems for any kind of dimension of life. Um, that they have an insights into or directly manage. So, uh, and I think as, especially I, I talk about autonomy, but when, when intelligence becomes relevant for so many fields like technology, uh, the functioning of our economy, not only traditional security policy, then you can also make much more use of these, these uh, all these sensors, which some of our would be open source, some not, but uh, or kind of hybrid source, but but still yes. So there's there's much to do here for the for the European Union, I think, to kind of use uh, all the, the the sources of information it actually has access to and form and transform that into intelligence, or uh, but that, then again we end up in discussion of of accountability and, and what more insight we want. Um, into these systems. On these kind of intelligence gaps, what are we missing in terms of intelligence to go forward with autonomy? Um, first of all, I don't think intelligence is the main barrier here. As perhaps Gustav indicated, there's other aspects of this idea of strategic autonomy that will that is more problematic, the general kind of political will and the strategic ambitions of member states or different threat perceptions. But still, uh, when it comes to intelligence, I think the the kind of insights into and knowledge about uh, the technical sector and also the private sector is lacking. Most European intelligence agencies and security services are, are still much better at counting tanks and hopefully keeping track of terrorists, but less so on kind of global value chains and, and high-end uh, technology. So this is a intelligence demand for autonomy, but I'm not sure that the intelligence system will need to be the supplier. This could be an area where, where instead you buy, uh, Gustav talked about Bellingcat or, or kind of uh, high-end, uh, very specified consultancies, etc., could possibly provide this kind of information. Uh, but that's one gap, I think. Another gap is, is the more wider intelligence 
input into the EU's different, there are a few actually intelligence cells or functions within the EU. And I think that would be helpful to build more of political uh, buy-in and, and to act on the information if, if more member states were more active in providing intelligence. Uh, another area where I worry a little bit about is the, the when it comes to economic knowledge and sanctions. Uh, here, the EU uh, rested pretty heavily on on the, uh, on the UK for this kind of information, uh, targets for sanctions, etc. So post Brexit, I think there that could be a kind of intelligence gap when it comes to the EU of kind of designing these smart and well structured sanctions. Uh, hopefully I'm wrong, but I, I worry about that. And finally, I would say this very time sensitive intelligence still for operations, uh, whether a direct, uh, I mean, intelligence from satellites or other sensors but are ex that are extremely time sensitive. I think there we still have an intelligence gap that doesn't really allow us to, to perform so well in, in the crisis management operations uh, as an example. So that's a few gaps to fill. Thanks, Bjorn. Uh, Claudia. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the, the notion of the courts, um, I mean, I've, I've briefly touched on it. The courts are an interesting one, right? And we've seen an increasing number of, of court trials in the Western world concerning issues of intelligence in the 21st century. And that is partly, arguably, because some of uh, the parliamentary bodies and others could not entirely do um, the job. But, but what courts can do is often is of course normally related to individual cases. This is more a bit of a firefighting approach than what a parliamentary accountability body could do, right? In, in, it's a different uh, a notion of accountability, which, which certainly has a place, but uh, just does not uh, do all the functions. Now, in the, concerning the extraordinary renditions, for example, we had an early court case in Italy concerning the case of Abu Omar, who was abducted in Milan. Um, and that ended up in, 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 I think, 23 American intelligence operatives to be uh, um, um, uh, tried uh, for his abduction. Um, but then you end up with these international uh, arrest warrants, basically. And, and um, as long as these people do not uh, go back to Italy, um, nothing really, really happens. It, it certainly sent a strong signal, um, but um, it, it, it kind of stopped there at that particular point. So um, yes, uh, no question about it. The courts have a role to play in all of this, um, but uh, like all the other uh, accountability bodies, uh, we can look at, um, they have a certain purpose and they have certain limitations um, and, and, and that we need to take into account. Um, and maybe the other question, I'm afraid uh, my French is not very good, so uh, I rely here on Jill's translation for it. <laughs> but yes, uh, well, what is the role for intelligence in a democracy, right? Um, um, I think that's what it seems to go back to. Um, um, is it being misused for political uh, ideologies or um, or is it, uh, what kind of function does it have? And we can have a very long discussion about that, of course. Um, um, but the, from, from a liberal point of view, the understanding would be that uh, we need intelligence services to, to keep states and people safe to some extent, but because it is within a democratic framework, that has to come with certain restrictions, um, that has to, um, uh, human rights uh, have to be applied um, and, 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 and some kind of accountability framework needs to be done. And, and nearly all Western countries have this kind of arrangement um, uh, by now um, um, with France and Canada, some, some of the more recent ones having established a parliamentary uh, a body uh, overseeing intelligence. Um, so the, so the, the national uh, trajectories here are, are very distinct, but I think the overall idea uh, uh, within these democratic setups um, is, uh, is very much the same. And I'm not saying it works perfectly anywhere, <laughs> um, but it is, um, that is the, the, the core idea behind it, arguably. 
Thanks, Claudia. Um, and uh, Gustav, just to complete this round, just to recall the, the one of the questions on Bell and Cat capabilities need for stronger open source capability. But I think this uh, the question in French also would be of interest for you because uh, you touched on it a little bit in the comments you made about the situation in certain European uh, Union member states. But this is about you know are these agencies not in the service of ideologies and right. and you know and powerful groups so maybe you could offer a few more thoughts on that thank you okay um uh, thanks a lot so on on open source intelligence well most member states countries intelligence services rely on police work and open source intelligence there there isn't much more because you don't have the capabilities um the, the eu standard is not the french intelligence environment or the british uh, the eu standard is kind of the czech or the well the dutch are actually above average they're pretty good for a small for, for a medium-sized country but um this um this is where we are uh, and uh and that needs to be taken into account uh even these open and total source intelligence capabilities are sometimes quite weak because we don't do many things we don't have the language capabilities um and and the resources and the people to to really run that uh but uh, but yes it could do more uh, the second thing and that relates to sort of the eu intelligence center is sort of the role of i think the role will grow inevitably i mean i have i've painted in in the last answer sort of the ideal scenario that i know is more more academic than real but the thing is that we we are still even if you talk about this sort of um salisbury and the, the big spectacular operations uh, most day-to-day -day operations are uh, uh, economic and technological espionage. Um, the Russians are seeking seeking to circumvent sanctions, and the Chinese uh, want to sort of keep up uh, and and chip some corners on R and D and getting technology, machinery, special materials, etc. And there's a wide range of network of frauded companies and brass plate companies, and not only for money laundering. It's sort of for technology laundering. It's it's kind of the same thing. Uh, and there are wide varieties with, with sort of totalitarian opponents in now the multipolar world. You you have to you have to be as paranoid as to think that they will harness every part of civil society for their own needs. So they will infiltrate student associations, sort of send agent students to our universities, uh, whatever. You know you can't be as paranoid as not to as as not to uh, come into channels where they sort of try to get something. And here is is the the use role on on many of many of these networks. Um, you actually you actually uh, start to look into or or notice that the strange things are happen and that things are beyond the normal. If you sort of look uh, into policy issues where they overlap uh, and and where certain institutions start to get their fingers into 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 different business uh, uh, relations and personal contacts that usually wouldn't suit or fit their normal way of operation. And here the EU as this overarching body that has such wide regulative power and of course they collect so many informations on all the economic and technological and educational spheres that we have across the EU is the data point you, you need to get to because without, uh, without uh, harnessing this sort of our own data that we produce uh, uh, administrating all the EU processes and policies across the entire societal spectrum uh, you, you basically have no detection chance or have a very low detection chance of getting getting sort of noticeable enemy structures uh, to, to, to appear. Um, uh, but, you know, how we'll do that, who, who knows? Um, ideology and sort of the bad intelligence services. Uh, well, yes, all intelligence services have their ideology. Uh, or not their ideology, but there is a kind of predominant political culture in that respect of security apparatus. But it can, can be different even in one country. Um, we have countries where the military intelligence is more social democratic or, or, or left leaning and the police is more right wing. They control each other. They don't trust each other because they, they are of opposing camps. But it's a, it's a way of control. Um, uh, it might sound stupid, but it is. The same is from country to country. Uh, you have uh, different national services with different ideological and political predominant administrative cultures, uh, and they're to some point watch each other. Um, and the more you come to sort of the center in Brussels, the more you have so many different um, 
backgrounds who, who watch each other. And that's what I said, it's easy to corrupt one state, but it's, it's basically impossible to corrupt an entire system as big as the EU. Uh, you, you, can, you can insert yourself into a certain operational culture and ideological culture and friendship networks, but that's one, uh, 26 left. Uh, uh, so, so, so uh, th there is, there are self-regulating mechanisms in that. If you dig deeper, of course, into scandals in, in my home country, for example, it's sometimes really appalling, uh, which high, high, high figures are, are basically selling themselves out, uh, to, to a foreign intelligence service for, for whatever, for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, then we have neighboring countries who, uh, and, and, and big brother in Washington who watches this and at a time sort of jumps in. Um, that's, I, I know it sounds stupid, but it's, it's the way it is. Well, no, thank you for being so, so, so frank with stuff and thanks for that round. I'm gonna cluster the next, uh, the next comments and questions. Um, so you'll forgive me uh, for loading you up here. We have one from Jean-Noël Berroub who says, as part of the intelligence demands of European strategic autonomy, could the European Union accelerate development and implementation in Europe of the new computer data encryption systems to possibly prevent intrusions by the next generation of quantum computers? Um, that strikes me uh, as something that either uh, Bjorn or maybe Gustav could take. Um, uh, Jim Cox reminds us that Five Eyes, uh, and I was going to mention this, uh, there's an oversight and review council, um, and it meets jointly with the Quint, um, also with the attorneys general of the Five Eyes, but these are information sharing bodies. They're not multinational accountability bodies. Mm -hmm. Clearly, when you exchange information, there's something that happens uh, about accountability, but they are not formal accountability bodies. Um, there's a question here, as a non-European, what is the role of EU INSEN in this discussion and can it be leveraged to further cooperation? And um, I'm gonna give you the next two just cause we're at a, we have about 17 minutes left. Could EU states consider a model where less sensitive categories of intelligence are provided to an EU wide fusion center while more sensitive materials retained by member states? Can we think of practical classification schemes that are harmonized across the EU could this help facilitate co uh, cooperation, a sort of um, variable geometry? And then the, the final one uh, from, our, from uh, the participants is, given the limited competencies of the EU in the field of intelligence and national security, and the apparent reluctance of intelligence services to give up operational autonomy, one could state the majority, that the majority of EU intelligence support actually happens outside EU structures. As a result, are accountability mechanisms and bodies at the national level not simply best suited and best positioned to keep an eye on intelligence cooperation in changing and flexible, flexible arrangements and let these supervising bodies cooperate flexibly in specific cases? So um, I, I think that what I will do is uh, I'll start with uh, you, Claudia, and uh, then I'll come to Gustav and then to Bjorn for a response to any and all of those questions that you would like to take. Um, and then I'll come back to you for some final comments and uh, we will wrap on time. So let me start with you, Claudia. Yeah, thanks. I, um, I'm gonna pick up Pepin's uh, uh, comment here. I mean, this is, this is uh, clearly what we are having at the moment, right? We are having na national accountability bodies which are holding their national services to account. And that also includes their sharing of information with EU member states uh, in whatever kind of, of channel that then actually um, um, happens. And yes, a, a case can be made for that to kind of say that that is a very established system and um, we must not forget how, how uh, the accountability structures in, in intelligence have emerged as well here. I mean, we are talking of, about a fairly rapid history here um, um, since the 1970s, 1980s uh, for some countries um, uh, where parliamentary bodies had to kind of create channels uh, and ways and procedures of overseeing uh, their national in intelligence 
agencies where they had to build up trust in order to kind of receive the information they need in order to do their work properly. And, and many people would kind of say that these relationships remain very fragile. Nobody likes to be really held to account. Um, um, and, and especially, um, you know, leaks were mentioned earlier, this kind of fear that, that parliamentarians couldn't be trusted and would leak uh, um, as sensitive information. And so um, um, accountability bodies have to work against that very much. And arguably that's maybe easier to manage at the national nev level um, than at a supranational um, level. So I think this is, this is the current arrangement and, and many people would say that has to be sufficient somehow, um, but, but there needs to be somewhat um, um, clarity about how information flows to the EU uh, and across. And, and, and I think Bjorn made it very clear that we are, we are talking about certain aspirations here um, and that the more intelligence will be shared um, at the EU level, the more this becomes a question of, of whether the national structures are uh, efficient. And I mean, we do have the European Parliament, you know, kind of looking into issues at some points already. So we have a bit of a snapshot um, um, element at the EU level um, um, already. Um, and with Europol, we've seen um, that over time, um, the accountability structures have moved um, um, to some extent from the national level to the supranational level um, and then we have a mix there now um, and, and so so different ways are, are definitely possible and, and I guess nothing is, is off the cards here um, but it needs to be thought through uh, very carefully. Thank you Bjorn. Gustav? You're on mute. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. Uh, just a few, two finger to, to sort of leaky parliamentarians. Um, just from my practical point of view, more stuff and the more serious stuff get gets leaked by by compromised people within the organization and the, the wider security apparatus. It doesn't have to be the intelligence organization, but the the kind of police, judiciary, but usually police uh, or Ministry of Defense apparatus that further passes on for or uses that part of the information. That's that's the bigger risk than than the parliamentarians. I mean, if an intelligence service is too stupid to report to parliament in a way that they don't compromise, in a way that you know can't figure out how how to report without compromising sources uh, and compromising their operational procedures, uh, they should be fired. Uh, sorry, you know uh, that <clears throat> this is the basic skill of an organization. In, to, to report as, as much as necessary and, and, and not, not the details that you shouldn't. Um, and that's a, I, I think this problem is, is, is by far overrated. Uh, and Parliament, especially the European Parliament, there are, there are serious people in there. Uh, and if they would have a, a wide ranging oversight committee that has sort of special clearances, et cetera, it, it would be within the parliament's range to appoint people who are reliable for that. But uh, I mean, the, the same is with the Senate. You know, you have crazy senators, uh, but not all of them. And if, if the system works well, then people who are in the intelligence oversight committee are sane. It's historical in it always as it was, but usually it is. Um, so uh, uh, network security standards, uh, there is one body in the EU that is one of the most underrated and unknown one, but one of the best that is ENISA, the European Network Security Agency, uh, that defines the, the sort of secure, the, the standards for, for EU um, uh, communication security. Um, and they are actually, uh, they're relatively new. Um, they're winding up uh, their operations, but they so far seem to be good. Uh, and yes, it's their job to draft sort of the, the security standards for the next generation uh, of, of, of communica secure communication and governmental communication uh, networks. And it's also their, uh, their job to certify and build up uh, cyber incidents response teams that respond then to, to virus breaches to that or to, to virus incidents and train them. Uh, so so this, is, this is a thing that is in the making, but I, here actually the professional level on the EU level is actually good. 
Uh, EU Insen is a bit smaller. Yes, they, they basically are the EU's open source or sort of data analysis on what the EU produces plus what member states feed them. Uh, the problem is it's very small by now. So it's, it's, it's more of a coordination data agglomeration institution than has a really uh, individual analysis and detection capability at the moment. Um, but that's with, it, with the staff numbers they have, there's not much, much more you can do with this. <clears throat> people, people have, have certain limits. Um, so, so this is, is it. Gustav, thank you. Bjorn, I'm going to ask you to take uh, whatever uh, selection of those questions you would, you would like, and also to add um, a 60 seconds at the end, and I'll come back to, to uh, Gustav and to Claudia too, a single thought that you would like us to take away in terms of future awareness, future research, or future action. Over to you. So uh, just on um, uh, on the EU, whether the EU can consider a model with where kind of less sensitive uh, intelligence are provided to an EU-wide fusion center, I think more or less formally that has been applied to most of the kind of sharing uh, arrangements that exist uh, both within and and uh, outside of the EU in different ways. If we look at the, the INSEN, which was started as the, the CITSEN uh, about 20 years ago, um, the, this division was, was actually physical. There was a few countries that were allowed or invited to send analysts that was actually sitting in one room and then it was expanded, but there was an outer layer where the other countries could provide information, but they didn't get access to the full picture. So that was one kind of division between the high sensitivity and slightly lower sensitivity. Um, if we look at Europol, uh, there is uh, you can you can uh, share information with all countries uh, that is uh, members of Europol takes part in work. But you can also use the Europol infrastructure to send information to only specific countries that you either trust more than others or that are involved in a specific case that you are working in. And if you look at the statistics of data shared through Europol, you can see that that's that's a very common usage of the Europol. So they use the network but not for multilateral intelligence exchange, but actually for bilateral. Is that a problem? I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's better than nothing. At least Europol provides a, um, a hardware to allow for this kind of exchange, which perhaps wouldn't take place in its absence. Although in, in, in many instances, it would be even better if the intelligence was more widely shared. But, but with more trust, that will hopefully uh, take place in the future. On Insen, I would still like to be slightly more upbeat than, than than Gustav. I mean, yes, it is small, and they I guess they do what they do with their size, but still, it's I think it's uh, it's at least uh, ten times bigger than than for ten or at least fifteen years ago, um, and they have also with I think Insen has been one also for non as non European. What is the role of Insen? Well, it's them, they they provide a foreign policy establishment of the EU machinery with information and analysis and also on, on international terrorism, uh, if it has implications also for, for Europe, but they don't do with, deal with other kind of internal security issues. But one, uh, one big benefit for instance was to the access to all the EU delegations with establishment of a joint diplomatic corp between the commission and the, the, what was called the council. Uh, so before the EU has delegations about 140 something in the world, and they were traditionally staffed with experts on trade and to some extent development, uh, because that's what the, the European Commission who drove these delegations, who owned these delegations, dealt with. But now they are increasingly also staffed with, with uh, political analysts and security experts. And that's one example of how you can kind of leverage a common tool like this, because then you'll then you actually have a, an apparatus uh, that is possible to do analysis on a scale that actually most member states do not have. Some clearly have much more capacity, but quite a few member states would not have 140 delegations with security expertise that can send uh, help you kind of do your your security analysis uh, for you. So, so I think by 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 using more of this information that the EU has access for, that is one way to leverage the work of of Insen as an example. And yeah, on on the general takeaway, oh, so many topics we've been. But since we've been discussing the kind of ideal or aspirational 
uh, ideas of whether of accountability or of intelligence per se or cooperation and what should happen. I guess my 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 um, 60 now 30 seconds would be about please remember that things do not always turn up as you think. You can have a great political will, uh, but you'll still have services that for different reasons, and Gustav mentioned the political inclinations, but there could be other kind of professional cultures involved that just that has the result that member states won't get what they ask for. Uh, and I think Europol is a good example when, when during the terror attacks uh, the last 15 years in Europe, politicians have constantly said that Europol must be much more, must be the node of counter-terrorist intelligence. It must be lead the charge against terrorists, but it didn't really help. The security services were still unwilling to send information. They sent copies of what, what they saw on BBC rather than their own intelligence, just not to, to, to interrupt existing networks of exchange uh, that they were kind of owners of. So there's lots of bureaucratic issues here and cultural issues that you might not think about uh, but we'll still make sure that member states do not actually always get what they ask for. So a blueprint isn't all. Thanks for that, Bjorn. Uh, Gustav, because we're running out of time, I'm just going to ask you for your 30 second takeaway, and then I'm going to come to Claudia, and then I'm going to keep us on time because I don't want to keep my good friend and colleague, uh, Daniel Jean, waiting. So to you, Gustav, for 30 seconds. Okay, awareness. Um... Uh, security clearances for the EAS and the local staff that they're working with. Uh, the, the, it's, it's a national prerogative to clear a certain person for, for an EU post. The, the problem is the national standards for this are so completely different and in some countries completely ineffective. Uh, uh, this is, I think, the biggest security risk. The, and, and for foreign posts, you know, it's not about the diplomats, but it's his secretary and the local assistants and the translators, uh, where do they get their security clearance from? But well, they have quite a large access to, to stuff and documents. From my point of view, that is much, much more risky than sort of, or easier to access this than to access sort of the central institutions uh, and their networks in Brussels. Um, researchers, uh, as, as I lined out, sort of, we need an integrated financial, technological and travel situation awareness. Um, uh, there, there's, uh, I, I know everybody hates II, but this is this is a thing where it can really help us, and we we need to get get better to to detect a, a, the sort of the, the interlocutors and, and node ponds of, of enemy networks in Europe. And on action, I, I'd love to see more political pressure on on the weak states and and the, sort of the corruptionists in Europe, that, that would take guts from the side of the bigger member states. Um, I'm just frightened how delicately Orban is treated in, in the EU with all the problems he creates. Um, and, and this needs to stop urgently. Thanks, Gustav. Claudia, your 30 seconds, take away. Yeah, so I think my takeaway would be um, Intelligence cooperation is here to stay. Uh, it's becoming increasingly complex. It's increasingly built into intelligence work in a number of countries. And that really raises very difficult questions if we take this notion of democratic accountability serious. And I would like to see more conversations about this at the national and possibly um, at, at the regional or, or supranational uh, level, um, but it is something that we have seen now with a number of issues, whether that's data surveillance, whether the, whether the extraordinary rendition and secret detention program and other counterterrorism related issues, um, but the next theme will be around the corner and it would be very important to kind of set up accountability mechanisms that can actually challenge uh, what happens within these structures. Well, thank you for that. I mean, what an absolutely fabulous panel. And happily, we're at noon and my three panelists basically summed up. So I'm just going to close with a couple of very, very quick words. Our session was on European and transatlantic intelligence co cooperation. I think it's fascinating that we basically had a, a very in-depth uh, discussion about accountability, which I think shows the essence and importance of this issue uh, in an era when, uh, when trust is at a premium and under so many different pressures. 
And I'm going to um, end with a variation on a theme of something that Bjorn said, you know, things don't always turn out the way you think. And it makes me uh, think of um, that Rolling Stones song, you know, you don't always, you know, get what you ask for, but you get what you need. So let's hope that we at least get what we need when it comes to looking forward to European and transatlantic intelligence cooperation in terms of accountability work towards some sort of common you know, strategic culture, all of the, uh, the excellent points that have been made uh, this morning by Bjorn and Claudia and Gustav, who I wanna thank most warmly for an absolutely terrific session and also to everybody for the excellent questions and comments that came in. And I think I can hand it back to you now, Justin, just at 12 o'clock noon. So thanks again to my wonderful panel. Thank you very much, Jill, for chairing this panel uh, masterfully, really, and on time, it's, it's really great. Thanks to Gustav, Bjorn, and, and Claudia for excellent uh, papers, and I look forward to looking into it even more.